Excellent. Well, thanks everyone for joining us out here. <laughs> and uh, you started to tell me a little bit about this, uh, Keith, but I was wondering if the two of you could just kind of narrate your your initial meeting, your initial coming together, and I understand you've sort of been in communication over the decades after meeting here in, in <laughs> New York, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> over the ages. Um, and then how you started to think about this exhibit and where the, the sort of uh, collaboration began. Uh, <clears throat> Edgar and I met uh, in the 80s, the early 80s. Uh, we exhibited together, actually met in Brooklyn. Uh, we worked together and we've known each other for since that time. <clears throat> but it actually kind of evolved uh, more recently, uh, this project. And we, we like to think of it at the beginning when we first met at George Floyd Square and uh, two, two years ago, mm -hmm. the scene of the police murder there of, of uh, George Floyd. And uh, Edgar was visiting from Oklahoma and he wanted to see the site. <clears throat> so we went there. And uh, it was very somber, a lot of some people praying, some people uh, very somber, and some people very uh, engaged. Um, there's a lot of visual material there at George Floyd Square, and it's, it's uh, very meaningful. And, and we were both kind of taken aback by it. I have been there many times because I live in Minneapolis, but uh, just to be with Edgar there and to be at the moment and to kind of see all this visual visual activity, posters, a lot of mementos, a lot of uh, street uh, words, and it was very touching about what was happening in the world at the time, and, and we were there at that moment. So <clears throat> we, we talked about it, and I think I remember Edgar saying, um, you know, the, this is where the real art is, frankly, and you're not in museums, it's, it's here. This is the kind of a, the, the uh, origins of things. And uh, so we, we talked, we discussed things. <clears throat> and uh, I've been working on a project for a number of years because of my own uh, activities with, with a group called the Remember 1934, uh, which commemorates a labor strike in Minneapolis in 1934. And I've, it's been my project and my interest. I've worked with the descendants of the strike and we work on uh, commemorative picnics and street festivals. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a way of keeping this labor strike kind of alive, but it's also a way to connect to what's happening to today. Uh, the activism then is very much related to today. So after I told Edgar, you know, a number of the guys in the strike were Native, Native American. And uh, he said, what? And he said, he said something like, uh, you know, Natives weren't included in anything. And, uh, and then after some discussion and some time, he came back and said, I did some word pieces about, about these two, two people, these two individuals mm -hmm. who participated in the strike. Uh, one was Emmanuel Holstein uh, and the other was Ray Rainbow. And he did work with them. And, and I was uh, very happy to collaborate with Edgar. He asked me to collaborate with him. And I, I was glad to do that. And I, and I, I do want to acknowledge, I feel like I, I am a uh, ally in this because this is a project about uh, native engagement, uh, but, but it really ties into a, a kind of collective action that happened, in, uh, I think in terms of the past, the 1934 strike, it happened in a personal level with Edgar's own family. Yeah. And finally, uh, it's happening today with the water protectors and, and other activists and it's very much indigenous-led activism and change. So it's it all ties together for us, and that's that's why we developed this project. Yeah, yeah and I can I can add a, a little bit to that. And uh, you know, we, it's all about community, really, uh, for me. And uh, like my family is here: <laughs> Desba from eighth grade, my wife Shanna there from Concho, trying to wrap whole country now. And, executive there at the tribal complex and a professor, uh, writer, PhD from Middlesex University in London, art critic. But anyway, having the family here is, is so important to me. And, and Lou and I did work together as well, uh, in Buffalo and, and here in Chelsea, you know, but I want to go back to meeting Keith and, and uh, just, just 
share a little vignette about that. And community goes far, far and wide. And and so there's tribal people come in and out of the city. Mm -hmm. uh, back in the 80s, I was coming from Oklahoma again to New York, and I was working with group material, you know. And actually, Vito Conchi was in the show. So he came to my studio in Philadelphia, at Cottage Field Barn. So I was I was elated to be with Vito, you know, doing doing an installation piece. And I was walking around, and it was a place called Terminal New York, which is mm -hmm. on the docks, a uh, military terminal. It was, you know, so it was a piece about war, the show. Uh, and Keith had some sculptures up, so did his brother. And there's another artist who was showing at PS1. His name was Frank Big Bear, who was a local artist in the Minnesota area, a really great draftsman, does great drawings. And so I was walking around looking at all the other work when I got my work hung up. And Keith looked at me and said, are you Big Bear? <laughs> <laughs> I'm big, but I don't know if I'm Big Bear. Like, <laughs> uh, what? You know? And I didn't know Frank Big Bear. I don't think I didn't know Frank Big Bear. And, uh, and so Frank was going to stay at Keith's house as his loft. And, uh, so, and so we got to talk and we traded addresses. And, and Frank had a show at PS1. Well, I'm, I'm now a trustee at Mama PS1 of all places. I'm a trustee there. And I work with the museum. Um, and so we both showed up at Frank's show, and Frank got lost in the subway. He missed his own. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dude, you know, so so I could have sold all his work, but he made a lot of money. <laughs> but everyone thought I was Frank Big Bear. <laughs> <laughs> Guess what? You know, and then so so anyway, we 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 you know stayed in touch. I've come to town, and we you know we got together all the time for many many years, and uh, and so that's that's kind of how we got got started you know but but again the community and of course now i know frank and i've been with frank you know in minneapolis and whatnot you know, so we're all together again in a sensibility um and so you know that goes back to my family my mother my father's up here charles many magpies heap of birds a portrait that that keith made of, of my dad who's passed um and so uh the painting that he made the actual uh wood panel is in my mother's bedroom mm -hmm. so I, we were just there the other day uh having dinner together you know on the reservation and, and uh, i looked at his painting that she has sitting right there she doesn't want to drawing herself a lot by her bed she's kind of in a wheelchair so she sits there and draws and does her artwork and she has the piece there so it's really touching that he created that work you know for my mother uh, in, in addition to these you know too so we, we this so the whole project kind of moved along in a very fluid way I do a lot of printmaking, you know, and so I print in Santa Fe often uh, at Fort Dimension Studio. And so I had a big project, about 48 prints to do. And I do that in Santa Fe, I think about three days, two, three days. So I worked in these four prints here in the kind of the, the work work uh, task uh, to get it all done. So I made these four just for this show, just for this project. Um, and then we made the banners from that. And I we did he did research, he did about the union activist and my father was at Beach Aircraft and he he was a union member. We grew up in union kids, six of us. My mother was a union steward and that really protected mm -hmm. us kind of from all the violence and all the poverty in which Kansas as I grew up and and we raised this whole family there. You know, so I created these pieces uh for the show about these issues. And then these are Jacle prints. They're not the actual real uh, mono monotype. These are digital scans. And so because of the weather and the humidity, we had to do a different kind of situation to get them in, in here. That's why we have the banners, too, because it's more of a, a kind of fluxus kind of thing. You know, so they're, they're very, very uh, durable that way, yeah. and uh, ambient in a sense. So, so I'm really happy to have the community work here. And then the community ex ex extends to you being here. It's cold outside, <laughs> and then here you are, and you probably come to other events here. You know, it's my first time being here yesterday, so it's great to have the community support this kind of effort as well. Mm -hmm. Well, it's good to hear um, who Holstein was. That was one of my questions: was who Holstein was, and I imagine he was a Jibway. You know, yes, and yeah. uh, uh, yeah, 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 a Jibway, yeah. So there was a bit of kind of research that went into this is the, a the project. Mr. Uh, Emmanuel Hap Holstein and this find Edgar is Ray Rainbow. They they were the native. Those the two people, yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in the strike of 1934. 
Yeah. And so you you knew that your family was involved in, in union struggle, yeah. but learning about the Minneapolis strike was sort of a new dimension to thinking yeah. about Native yeah. involvement in labor struggles. Or? And we had many, uh, I recounted, and, and we have a book that we, we kind of co-authored and designed, and, and I, I made, made it, wrote an essay about that, and about, about the, the strength of the community from my reservation going forward to Kansas mm -hmm. from Oklahoma, and of course, Oklahoma was Indian territory. It wasn't meant to be a state at all. It was like a, an apartheid uh, situation like South Africa, you know, where 39 tribes were brought there. And then they lost territory all across America, Florida, Oregon, New York. And they all came there. The 39 tribes still there. And they all have little tiny reservations in a sense. But there was no work there. There was no, there was no economy. They were picking cotton, a lot of poverty, living on the creek. You know, my grandmother talks about if you want to make coffee, you got to knock the ice off the water I mean, to make the water you know, on the fire. Um, and so they moved, uh, my mother and father moved to Kansas, and there was Beach Aircraft, Cessna, Learjet, Boeing, and they needed labor during the Cold War, you know, to make all their, their war tools, you know, and, uh, and they, they did, you know, work in that, in that realm, you know. So, so we had a lot of benefits mm -hmm. as children from the Union taking care of the family and, and, uh, and good things that no one else did for the people, you know? And, uh, and I recall my, my most kind of poignant memory is having no Christmas. And uh, I didn't, they didn't know what to say to us, you know? And, and my dad said, go look out on the porch. You know, we went out there and there were little toys that the union brought. Oh. You know? And then there would be no toys. And so then today, I wish that day would come back. You know, mm -hmm. where people cared about everybody, that everyone would have. I have another print where it says everyone should have something, and I really believe in that. You know, and that's why I do these kind of projects. You know, I gave a gift to Temple University to name a gallery and endow a uh, residency for Native artists forever. Now that mm -hmm. just started, you know, yesterday, two days ago. So everyone should have something, and so the unions have that kind of agenda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's something about. Um your work engaging like often with really current moments. You know, I saw the series you did for Standing Rock uh, with mm -hmm. the same kind of printmaking process, right? Um, but then there's also ways in which it's, it seems like a very contemporary form. And even these kind of remind me sometimes of protest signs uh, and the way that you can really tell like the trace of the hand and the statements that they're making. Um, but I kind of was wondering what you and, and Keith as well think of the relationship between art and, and history is about making history known in the present and sort of bringing people in. Because I actually hadn't heard about the 1934 trucker strike. So even just this you know, so exhibit was my introduction to that, uh, to that historical moment and how it sort of carries through and has effect in the present. It makes me think a lot of a lot of things, Lou, uh, yeah. about the, the role of history and what we're doing today. And I, I will come back to the point that in 1934, it was a collective action. Mm -hmm. these, these two guys, Holstein and, and Rainbow, were part of it. They weren't more or less. They yeah. were part of it. They were embraced by the other strikers. They were, they were considered part of the, the effort. So that, that's kind of a historical moment. But uh, going forward, after that, and, and, and to uh, Edgar's personal, experiences in history here again it was another collective action his father was a union member and his mother was a steward and she had to she had to negotiate for others who weren't native americans right and african americans yeah, yeah. so they were part of the collective. that's part they, of being in the union yeah. that was their history so they were contributing and giving and receiving and they were part of that and then finally the, the to me the inspiring story is what's happening in uh in northern minnesota with with the uh, water protectors group, uh, in, in, in many ways uh, inspired by Winona Leduc, but also in many ways uh, uh, part of another collective, a collective action to change to change them. So to me, the, the history is is self-evident uh, self in the sense that it, it happened then and it's it's happening now, and that's what we should draw from if we want to see positive change going forward. And a big part of the collective, obviously, is the elders. You know, that's mm -hmm. something a tribe is, is, is devoted to, you know, and, uh, and there's, there's major elder benefits in my tribe, and, uh, and they're honored, you know, and they're, they're kind of held, held in esteem, and also the youth. But, uh, but, but this project has been 
wonderful for my mother, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to to give her observations of when she was a union steward mm -hmm. and uh, when she was more viable, younger, you know, active a laborer in a, in a factory. Uh, and she gives us many, many great stories and, and input and historical ideas of, of what was going on then. You know, she talks about when she had to go forward and initiate a discussion so that African Americans could do other labor besides clean the bathrooms and into the trash. That beach aircraft wouldn't let them do any other work. It couldn't really evolve into higher levels of skill and you know mm -hmm. all that kind of uh, nomenclature to move ahead. You know, the labor. She had to go fight for the other workers. You know, and uh, uh, so those kind of things are really really important. And uh, so I'm really happy to have the project. And I gave her the book. You know, that me and Keith yeah. made. She's got it at home. I gave it to all my brothers and sisters. And and then they were also kind of reviewing the, our material. I would, we go out there every every weekend to have have a meal together, and we see each other all the time on the reservation. So I would kind of update everybody about what we were working on, and get more guidance about it. And see, is is that true? Like, and she got the book and said, "That's true." Mm -hmm. And I told Keith, "That's true." <laughs> Grandma said, "It's true." Yeah. We can move ahead, and that's how I work with all all my projects. Is that the elders they just tell me what to do, and I do what they say. You know, that's that's it's simple. I ask them, what do you want to do? How do you want to make it? What is, what's, what's the priorities? And, and I go that way. And then going back to Floyd, you know, I, in, in history, you know, in, in 91, I did a major project for the Walker Art Center. And I came to do a solo show. When I would do a solo exhibit in a museum like the Walker, uh, I usually do a public piece. And so I did my research and found the 38 warriors were executed by Abraham Lincoln mm -hmm. in Mankato, Minnesota uh, during the Civil War era. And they were hung all the same day, you know. It's like taking Congress or the Senate and hanging them all tomorrow. Like, and the leadership broke, you know, the tribe struggled, still struggles. Uh, and and what happened with Floyd was, was, a, was a terrible tragedy. But what happened with, with 38 Sioux people, and that's unknown. You know, and Lincoln's a hero, mm -hmm. and he's on my money. I had a camera in my wallet. Why do I have that murder on my wallet in my wallet with Jackson? And so there you have this history that people had to understand. And I put it out on the river. I, I made, there were 40 actually, plus uh, Johnson killed two more yeah. and hung them down in, in, uh, by the airport, you know. Um, and so sniff for Snelling. And so I made, a, I made an arc on the river and I put uh, 40 pounds of flour in the ground because the flower was why they killed them to make the shipping lanes and all the farms they wanted to kill all the Sioux people and move to South Dakota mm -hmm. and so I did all the research and made that presentation and then it was super provocative but the Walker you know didn't they stood behind it but then they called me the new Charles Manson I said I was the hate monger of America that I would come to tarnish this this great hero <laughs> Abraham Lincoln that killed 38 people in one day you know, so so you got that you got that pushback, mm -hmm. which that's so there's not a lot of native political art that's happening, and and you got to be more kind of forthcoming, you got to be more aggressive to make these historical things known, and so that's how I work this way. We work this way all the time. And so, uh, every day is a political day. <laughs> every day is a historical day, and we have to speak back. <clears throat> Let me kind of refer back to another project that that I was involved with in New York. It was part of this collective called the Repo History Sign Project in 1992, where a number of artists who created about 50 signs, and they were to kind of uncover the, 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 you know, the hidden histories of New York, including a slave market in the lower Manhattan, including uh, there's one sign of a, of a man falling out of, of Wall Street during the 1929 crash. I, I did a sign about the witch hunt trials, and it was stationed at Foley Square at the federal courthouse. So it was another, you know, kind of effort to, you know, reflect on history and and rethink it and and, and kind of present it to to people to 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 move on from there and, and to adjust and to uh, assess it in a, in a positive way. Yeah, that sounds similar to some of the stuff you've done as well with yeah the sign the form. Yeah. yeah, yeah, these interventions in public space. Uh, we'll have one. It's kind of another provocative thing. I, I'm doing a project at the National Gallery, you know, and I am Page Building. 
And so we've been kind of battling it, you know, I don't want to say too much on TV about it, but uh, <laughs> Zoom TV. But, but it's going to be all, it's going to happen now. And there's going to be a tribal native host panel in right. the National Gallery. Wow. And for a long time, there wasn't going to be like mm -hmm. some, there was some, some resistance there. Why? And they're very popular. They're very well known. They're expensive. I mean, they got all kinds of cachet, but the National Gallery was, you know, kind of a little nervous about that. But somehow it, it, it got pushed ahead. And so there'll be a, a piece remarking, you know, whose tribal land that is mm -hmm. inside the building about Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's for the Washington, D.C. You know, it's not for the tribe. It's for Washington, D.C. to understand where that building is. Yeah. Well, there's something um, just across what both of you were saying. Like, it made me kind of rethink some of um, even this piece, like, Do Not Dance for Pay. I'd always kind of thought about it in the sense of, the way uh, that Native people are called to, yeah, maybe perform their culture or the, the culture is commodified, but you really made me think about it as also as like, that's work too. Like people are doing work when they're uh, kind of being called into those those places. But also you were sort of, I feel like maybe making the argument that people who are you know on the front lines, they're also kind of workers, like, you know, the, and doing the anti-pipeline work or doing land defense, that that's also a kind of labor, you know, we, and that's a that's a a, a, a political figure um, mm -hmm. similar, you know, maybe now that the the factories are are gone, that there's other forms of kind of um, labor activism that connect to land struggle, and that's something that's really uh, that this exhibit has really made me think about is how those kind of intertwine. And I mean, your work does that a lot. I think kind of find those connections and 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 kind of openings for solidarity and the the textual language, also the visual language for establishing those mm -hmm. kinds of kinds of solidarities. I don't know. If I think you're right. Speak to that. I uh, think there is a real strong connection between those strikers in 1934 and then uh, those water protectors in northern Minnesota, the expanding into Michigan, Wisconsin. It's, it's not only localized there, but it is on native land. And uh, yes, it's it's uh, indigenous led and and, and uh, supported and involved. But there's a lot of lot of uh, allies coming there too, and there's been a lot of rest. People are, are putting themselves on the line and going to prison and go, going to jail and going to court. Uh, they they did that in '34, and they're doing it today with the same, I think, really similar passion for let's make this a better world. You know, mm -hmm. we're not going to stand stand for what's going on. And Edgar's, I think, beautiful phrase has a lot of. Uh, kind of resonance that way. I, I mean, I think it speaks to capitalism. Right? Mm -hmm. this, you know, why do we have to? Why do we have to be in this system when it's not working for us? And, and we can stop it. And we can stop it through collective action. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, well, certainly, I want to say I have, a, I have the most respect for the for, for my father's and, and mother's generation. Yeah. I mean, when you when you have in, in, in Oklahoma, it happened elsewhere in the country too, where you had, you know, the army would come to see you. <laughs> if they come to see you, that's a big problem you got. You know, they're not going to leave mm -hmm. without killing some people and, and and taking some land and making some violent actions. You know, that they, they don't call them in. Like when they go to Afghanistan, they're not coming to visit. <laughs> no. When that drone comes by your house, it's not going to just fly by. It's going to come kill everybody and then it'll come kill you at the funeral. When you come to bury your people, it'll kill you again. So... When they came to Oklahoma, that, that was their agenda. You know, they they built a fort from from Leavenworth to Fort Hayes. They couldn't find the Cheyenne, and so they they got lost and they almost died. Custer's army almost died, uh, maybe twice. So they had to build a third fort nearer where the Cheyenne would be in the winter, a fort supply. They could restock their army, then kill them properly. So that's what is happening in Oklahoma, Western Oklahoma, and it's called Custer County. Mm -hmm. right? And the town where they kill them is called Cheyenne. And at, at Custer County, when you got to go to jail, there was a big portrait of Custer at the courthouse. Jeez. So there's your justice. <laughs> when you're Cheyenne, you got to go see Custer at the, at the courthouse. Uh, that just came down recently. Hmm. So anyway, when that generation lived through that violence, had the camp on the creek, had no houses, then they made some kind of foray into some semi-urban life that was impoverished. Then they went to an urban place called Can Wichita, Kansas, mm -hmm. and worked at a factory. So that, that you know that transition, I mean, that's huge. Mm -hmm. That's a huge lifestyle challenge. And they survived that. A lot of them survived that. They didn't stay. I, I just want anybody left in Wichita that are native from that generation. They all went back home when they raised their families. They left. It wasn't for them. They left. 
And so, but so I, the, I call it the puncture. They punctured American society. They punctured it back. Mm-hmm. But they didn't. They they refused to 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 move away. They got in your face. They came to your town. They got your jobs, and they where you're leading their unions and they were doing their work and they didn't stay because it was not healthy to be that but then they went back home but i i think about you know how we get in some ways we get celebrated for being artists or professors or but you know this is easy compared to what those folks did when they went from camp army killing you camp and then to be a laborer in this thing that's overwhelming and survive that you know that gentrified world uh, and and still be able to make sense and take care of their families and and so I really have a lot of respect and that happened across all the tribes thirty nine tribes Creek Kiowa Comanche Osage Ponca all those tribes were up there and I met them all and I I'm gonna read off all their all their names and when I give lectures I just read all the names of all the all the Indians in Wichita that survived that wow. era you know? yeah but sadly enough a lot of them aren't they all moved back home which is good though they went back to mm-hmm. where they come from mm-hmm. yeah it's i mean it's like one of those kind of paradoxes and and but also possibilities that come about when you're either yeah forced off the land into cities or uh, you know sending kids to boarding schools and it's supposed to be this thing that erases your sense of tribal identity and your sense of uh, struggle but actually brings people together too you know like kids who are coming from different tribes, maybe at boarding schools or at finding each other in universities in the union or at work and kind of, you know, creating a, a common analysis of what's happening to them and finding the means to uh, try to change the conditions and maybe going and back home. And Minneapolis is a city like that too. Many tribes come there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Minneapolis is such a sort of crossroads yeah. for so many different political struggles and just peoples that kind of carry those struggles with them. It's a really interesting space. And I imagine Oklahoma is sort of similar. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Kansas, it's kind of bittersweet, but I've, I've been unpacking it more, but, but uh, you know, there's an urban Indian center there. Mm. And then when I was there, it was still kind of evolving. And so those, those disenfranchised people made their own community mm-hmm. within the city. But it, but it, and, I, and, I, and I joined it, and they were all air pack workers, and they were all union people, but they were all from different nations, you know? And I thought that's how it was. <laughs> you know, I thought, that, well, that's what you do. And, and no, you know, there's there's all kinds. Of, we're talking to some, someone earlier about Native America, and I said, there's no Native America. There never was. There's never going to be. You know, there's like all these different tribal identities. There's no Native group umbrella. You know, there is to the white people because they're not white, and so everything's polemical from white people to everybody else. But but the tribal folks are all individual. Mm-hmm. You know, nations. And so, you know, when they move back home, you know, the Creeks have their nation, the Wichita Caddo, Comanche again, Kiowa, and they don't really interact a lot. <laughs> they don't even need to go down there and bother anybody in Kiowa country. You know, you Cheyenne have Cheyenne Rifle have their thing, Kiowas have their thing, Comanche have their thing, Creeks, Seminoles, all these people, Apaches, and we respect that. But we don't really go and, and interact, and no one's making you do it. Mm-hmm. Join their tribe, or they can't do that, you know. So it's really an individual set of nations, like France and Russia and Italy and Australia. It's like that that kind of identity. It's not affected or in Oklahoma. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, not that we're in the city. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, Lena, they're blend up here in, in Oklahoma. They, mm-hmm. They've joined with the Wichita Caddo. They're called the WCD, and and they were disenfranchised, moved you know from here to Pennsylvania, Ohio, and some of them are stretched out through all those different states. But the main nation, in a sense, that's got a, a reservation is in southern Oklahoma by a town called Anadarko. Mm. You know, that's where the Delaware are. Um, so is this collaboration blossoming kind of beyond this exhibit, or where would you like to kind of see this exhibit lead to or kind of open up for people if there's a kind of enduring message for it? There isn't a plan, yeah. uh, but I have a hope that it, it, it gets extended. Um, I think it, in Minnesota would be a, a great place because there's a lot of tie-ins to Minnesota, but uh, it could really expand to, to touch onto other issues. Mm-hmm. Especially with the labor ac- activism today, it's it's actually very promising. There's so many uh, young people forming unions and uh, 
it's, it's really a, a very vital and kind of exciting time for, for change. People are, are activated. And so um, we hope that it, this can help with that. And that's, that's the hope of the project, maybe ex expand the, the inclusion of water protectors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the 1934 strike had some implications also because a number of the people, like Leia Rainbow, the guy uh, depicted here, he was uh, very active with the Union Guard after after the 34 strike, and he uh, was involved with this uh, anti-fascist movement because the fascists were moving into Minnesota before the before the war because they hated the Jews, they hated the Catholics, and they hated the unions. Mm. So the union said, "Wait a minute, that's us." <clears throat> and there was a big meeting called for this in, in uh, Minneapolis, and the the Silver Shirts they were called the, the Nazis of mm. of that era. Uh, and they, they were planning a meeting and Ray Rainbow came with his guys and they never showed up and they never came back. The, the Nazis left Minnesota because there was, I mean, the, so one thing connected to another, the, mm -hmm. the, the uh, solidarity of, of the strikers and of the group to confront other issues. Yeah. So. Well, my, my hope is, is behind the book, you know, mm -hmm. the book. It's such an excellent document, yeah. you know, visually and historically, and it's a collaborative document with, like, Keith was talking about the water protectors and my mother's reflections and my little essay and all these kind of things that can go out and, and just and just kind of pronounce, just kind of you know distribute the the word you know, yeah. of, of the history of what what happened and and the truth and uh, and to learn from it and and gain more allies like you're talking about mm -hmm. you know because uh, because again. The whole collective idea, which which Keith is very good, you know, he's very well versed to express that, is 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 a tribal identity. You know, it is about like the elders being served and the youth being served and people that don't have something being served. And that that is for everybody to, mm -hmm. to kind of uh, you know consider and hopefully move ahead. I just gave a talk at Temple University you know, two days ago, and I talked to the students and I and I gave a gift to the university. You might have mentioned that, and, and and so I came to kind of just uh, speak at the at the gift giving ceremony for this new gallery for Native artists to have residencies for the rest of the time, mm -hmm. and to have an exhibit in the gallery named after my family, which which is now a reality. And from from the proceeds of work being collected, I'm able to extend that kind of gift. And I just talked to the students about how. If you come somewhere, you know, the grandma would tell you, you got to take something. Mm. If you don't have something to take, don't go. She would say, don't stay home. <laughs> they don't need you there. If you can't bring, bring yeah. somewhere, with all, we, don't, <laughs> we don't need you to come. You know, grandma told me that. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the tribes, they, they live that way all the time. They don't, they don't do things without some kind of effort to, to exchange and get and support mm -hmm. people. And so I asked the kids, I said, here we are on this planet. You know, you came. What are you going to give? You know, that's all I want to know. I mean, it's not about you. It's like, well, what can you offer? What can you offer? And and uh, hopefully the show is going to extend that kind of sensibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's really beautiful how much you bring in just your family's history and presence into into the work you do. Uh, and I think that, yeah, my experiences of kind of those intergenerational spaces have either been in, yeah, more kind of, you know, native community, but also in political communities, right? And I think that that can make them so powerful, mm -hmm. having that kind of transmission and sense of, um, yeah, both the past and the future simultaneously. Um, so it's really cool to hear about you kind of drawing it all <laughs> here and then bringing forward yeah. and, and offering something, yeah, to those who are coming after. Today, that's, that's, uh, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a good point you're making about reconfiguring, uh, no matter where you're located, to, to find your allies, to find new ways to organize, to address problems. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess I, I want to keep repeating that the solution, in my view, is collective action. Yeah. It isn't just one or two people. Mm -hmm. It's getting together, work with other people, make change, mm -hmm. fight for it if you have to. And hopefully everyone here has gotten the book or can grab the book and also, yeah, read through the kind of record of that collective struggle from the past. And I mean, it just sounds like there's so much to think about how those conditions have both shifted to the contemporary, but also mm -hmm. seem very similar in the kind of complex of things that we have to confront in the present. 
I don't know if we can really handle group questions, but I did kind of want to, is that a possibility you think to, yeah, I'd love to, uh, others have questions. I know people have been asking about some of the figures represented and we've, um, we've covered that, but if there are other questions from the audience. If someone asks a question, if you- uh, Yeah, I we can kind of repeat it. it. Uh, sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, anything for, for Keith or Edgar about the exhibit or um, the many things that it touches upon. <clears throat> Hi, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks to the gallery as well. It's such a fun. My question is how, what are some examples of ways that white people who are living on the land now can be as respectful advocates? Yeah, I'd like to my question. What, okay. what are some examples of ways? Well, well I'm, you know, I'm working, I mentioned earlier that I'm a trustee at PS1 MoMA. And so we have a committee on land acknowledgement. And we're actually going to meet on Tuesday again, third meeting. And so we we and we have a facilitator, and we've been through a lot of discussions on different options, like kind of what you're speaking toward. You know, what what kind of uh, action is appropriate? You know, and um, and I do all these you know these sign pieces, and I do a lot of stuff about about you know land rights and all across Canada and America. I've done it since '88. And um, and so and we're we're gravitating toward maybe doing a sculpture of peace mm. as a land acknowledgement. But but my my perspective was, and we and we have a wonderful uh, advisor member. His name is Tecumseh Caesar Caesar from Long Island, Shinnecock. You know, so so he he works with us. He was with me in Philadelphia two days ago too, and so he gave us a good background on on the thirteen eight you know. Uh, divisions, not divisions, but communities of, of uh, Shinnecock people. Um, and so I thought about it, I thought, and I told everybody in the meeting, I said, you know, we should do something with some scholarship funding. Mm -hmm. You know, we have big money at MoMA. Got, there's a lot of money at MoMA, but there's a lot of support at MoMA monetarily. And, and we can make a sculpture, and maybe we, we should, but I think part of it needs to be action toward people in the tribe. And, and the land acknowledgement can be a scholarship. Mm -hmm. You know that you you empower a group of young people like I'm trying to do in Philly at Temple. You know the, the generations ahead to do, and you never know what they're going to do. You, they can do great things if you give them a chance. And and so I think having some kind of uh, cont contribution toward scholarships, you know, for Native youth in your in your area, because then you can empower the next generation of of warriors to go forward. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, you know that. Quincy actually has a workshop here and it's going to be a workshop here. Oh, he's going to come and do something here? Yeah, in two weeks. Um, oh, okay, great, great. Yeah. Now, I was thinking he might come tonight, but uh, right. yeah, well, we, we've done a lot. He did some nice necklace workshops and stuff, too. Right, yeah. Right. That's what he's going to do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, Tecumseh Cesar. Yeah, yeah. Tecumseh Cesar? Yeah. 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 Tecumseh Cesar. Yeah. 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 Can I say also that we work closely with Honor the Earth, which is the organization that uh, Winona LaDuc has uh, organized along with the Indigo Girls, but it's it's uh, doing a lot of uh, fabulous work and it's indigenous led and I, I would recommend uh, going to their website. We have a poster here that promotes them and the book, we promote them because we, we feel like they are extending the work of, of activism and, and change and we recommend them. Uh, by the way, Winona Duke wrote for the book for us, and and uh, the woman who did a, a, a documentary on, on Winona is called uh, First Daughter and the Black Snake. It's a really good documentary by Perry Pickett. Her work is in, in the book we have. And, and also I'll add that John Kim is another water protector, works closely with Winona Duke, and he's written for the book as well. So I just want to I encourage people to think of them as, as a real positive uh, social change, uh, indigenous led group. All right, we have a question from somebody named Lisa, who I guess was asking in the Zoom chat, uh, starts with a, with a comment that she loved the history that she's learned tonight and appreciate the value around collective action and the connection to family. Uh, excited to read about your mother's reflections, Edgar, and the various histories. Uh, and Lisa is wondering if you could talk more about the banners. Uh, I love the texture, the scale, the portraits, the words, and just wants to hear a little bit more about kind of how those were conceived. 
Well, it was, it was it's kind of the evidence of our collaboration. I mean, we we had Keith was working very well on the portraits, and that was something we wanted to identify. And then I had made the prints in Santa Fe, but then then the space and and you know community is all about reality. So again, the space is is a is a, is, a, is a very you know for me it's like a I call it earlier today we did the podcast yesterday, but I call it outlaw space. Mm. This is the outlaw space. <laughs> you know, they said MoMA here. It's not MoMA over here. <laughs> and no, they can move quick. They can move quick and strike and do what they need to do. But your work's going to flex with that too. You can't be fine art in here. You know, you can't be insured or well, I'm in control. We got the doors. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I got guys walking around with white gloves carrying my work around. It costs, you know, half a million dollars. They, you know, they got a, a different reality. So, so we had, we had to configure a, a, a way to present the work that would be, you know, solid in in the in in, in keeping with the spirit of the work, but then we have some flex to it. So then I think we got with the banner idea. We think of the banners as associative, uh, mm -hmm. connotates uh, public action, uh, announcements, marches. We 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 like the aesthetic uh, uh, meaning of, of the banners convey. It's, mm -hmm. it's not precious. It's public and it's expansive and it's physical. Mm -hmm. And then taking the prints and making them scanned into the larger scale of the banner. Um, and then I, then I decided to make the decay prints uh, from the actual model prints too. And I did a big piece in London where it was a, it was a 30 foot banner by native genocide in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an eco art hmm. situation. And I went to Berlin too. So I made some big banner pieces that were made for outdoors, mm -hmm. you know, so they can make it last outside. So we have a little one up here outside too. <clears throat> Oh, really? I didn't see that one. How the show is They were printed at Shopco uh, Printing in Minneapolis, probably one of the better, the best printing uh, operation in, in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. They do have a Walker Art Center materials. So they, they're professional. Very cool. So these might have uh, another life out in the in the street, in the outdoors. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then their addition now, too. We, you know, we, we're, we're trying to support each other in the gallery. So they're, they're, for sale when we signed them the other day so there there's one or four so there's four there's going to be four in the edition you know and uh then we, we split the proceeds with the gallery and whatever but but so 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 it's kind of got a little a little tinge of fine art right <laughs> big sharpie the big sharpie. <laughs> tools of the trade the big sharpie yeah well, any other uh questions from from folks here and I wanted to add just before we we're getting we're, we're maybe ready to close a bit, but yeah. there's there's three projects, you know, I've been really busy. So there's three projects near here and and there's a basketball court, uh Murray, is it Murray Park? Murray? Murray Park, uh uh in Queens near PS1. And so PS1 was kind of supportive a bit, but uh but backboard.com, common practice. Uh, so we've got those representatives right here. Say hello to everybody. <laughs> These guys painted my court. So I've got I've got two two basketball courts in in Queens right now. Full courts that are my paintings, and we got we had native post signs wrapped mm -hmm. on the backboard. And there's cards here to give away as well. Maybe you can show them the cards. So, so there's so here's here's the courts and. So that's right now in Queens right now. So it'll be up. And they, these guys ran a game today, so they're kind of tired. <laughs> they made it against the wall. <laughs> these young young guys ran a game, so, so they, they play ball. And my wife Shanna sunk a bunch of three pointers, you know, too. So <laughs> you gotta watch out for her. In the watch out, Steph Curry. In yeah. The corner over here. So so uh, so that that's happening, and that's that's for real. So and there's a nice book that they made too about the whole project of of, of common practice. And then MoMA has the Just About Midtown exhibit, which is mm -hmm. an incredible chronicle of the first black art gallery space in Manhattan and in New York. And uh, myself and Peter Jameson, who is a Seneca artist, a very great Seneca artist uh, from Victor, New York. Uh, he, he and I both were the first delegates into the black gallery in the 19, early 1980s. And so it's an amazing chronicle of David Hammond's Dowd Bay, Merritt Hashinger, I mean, 
all these superstar artists, you know, and we were all like young, unknown characters in the early 80s. So it's amazing. We were there today looking at the show and to, sh to see all that work together mm -hmm. and to see kind of the whole do it yourself, what this is all built on here, the outlaw world. <laughs> That's what Jam was. That's what Jam was. And, and and Linda Good Bryant, Linda Good Bryant, and Jenna Henry, and uh, and so and so and, and to tell you the story about that a bit, I did a piece for the show, for the first show they had, and uh, you'll get the, you'll go see it in MoMA. If you it's up for another week, I guess another week or so. That's closing soon, but I wanted to move back to Oklahoma, and I never really lived there permanently, and so I came one day with my Volkswagen bus with my ratchets and i just took the whole piece off the wall <laughs> and it was actually in the soho weekly news it was talking about and what his voice and <laughs> here's a young artist mfa from tyler he's coming to new york he's gonna be a big shot and i said i'm taking my piece and they said you're gonna move to brooklyn i said no i'm not gonna move to brooklyn i'm going to oklahoma and then they said the famous words we'll never hear from you again <laughs> that'll never work for you wow. oklahoma's never gonna work for you and so i had that work since 80 in, in my storage under the bed whatever <laughs> and then it came along and it was in, in needed and so now it's collected by a major foundation and now it's hanging up all <laughs> and so and, and it looks it, it says something so my life in the 80s and, and that still has some relevance i guess those comments there's that project and then there's also an exhibit as i mentioned at tyler school of art temple university we have a new gallery and it's the Edgar Huberberg's Family Gallery. It'll be a gallery for Native art residencies. Mm -hmm. And then it'll be a place to show the residency output mm -hmm. forever. It'll be, it's endowed. And we're looking for people to add to it if they want to add to it. But, but that's up now too. There's prints there as well. So that's all happening in addition to this one. So it's good to have all this support. Yeah, it's a lot going on. Yeah. And Oklahoma's Indian country, but it's also kind of outlaw country from what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> the major one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, all right. Well, thanks everyone for uh, sticking around and thank you to you two for doing all this work.